and uh, turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1, if you would please this morning, and if you're able to do so, would you, let's stand together out of love and respect for the reading of the Word of God, reverence for it this morning, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 3, the first two verses just tell us about uh, the children of Israel being beginning to being taken into uh, captivity, who the kings and the vessels of the house of the Lord that are taken, but uh, we pick up with the story relating to Daniel. Uh, immediately in verse number three. I'm not going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, but we will uh, go through that as we go along. I'm just going to read from verse number three down to verse number number eight. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave, the name, uh, gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want to preach you this message this morning, making decisions with purpose. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for such an example as one of Daniel. Lord, uh, just from, from childhood to manhood, Lord, to the end of his life, everything that uh, we as your people could hope to be in your sight. Lord, we know that he was not a man without sin. Lord, a, a man whose record has no blight on it of any sin. And Father, we just pray that uh, a principle that you thought was worth recording in your word w would be established in our hearts. We pray for the Holy Spirit now. Father, I give myself to you that the Holy Spirit might fill me with power for service, to be your voice, not the voice of a man. And Father, for your people, that our hearts and our minds would be open, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness and be filled with that which you have for us from your word and the, the spirit of truth, our teacher today. And we'll give you our thanks for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless the church. You can be seated this morning. Uh, if you're familiar with just kind of the uh, a little bit about captivity, uh, the, the, when Nebuchadnezzar, came into the land of Israel. He did with Israel what he did in other nations. And he, uh, again, the Babylonian Empire was the largest prevailing empire in the world at that time. And of course, it gave ways to the, uh, the medial Persian Empire and then the Greeks and then Rome. And what, what nations would do whenever you had, you had national empires, but then you had world empires. And what a world empire would do is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. Whenever they would conquer a nation, the first thing they did, they plundered its wealth. And you find that in the first two verses. They took it, and usually all the wealth was found in, in any nation. It was true of any nation. The temples were the national treasuries, okay? And uh, that, that was, uh, which is why you can't find any at Fort Knox. It was never a temple, okay? But the, the, the temples of the world were always, of the nation were always the national treasuries. And they would go take all the wealth. Then they would come back and they would take all what we would refer to as politicians, um, men of wisdom, uh, you know, something that were grossly lacking in our world today. They would take um, men of science, architects. They would take men with specific wisdom because these nations had built themselves to some degree and everybody knew something the other nation didn't know. And they would bring in all the, the wise men and then they would come back in a third time and they would take back all the, the trade skillsmen. They would take the artificers, you know, the, the, uh, the blacksmiths and the, the carpenters and the masons and the shipwrights and all the different trade guilds. And they, and they always left behind the poor of the land. By the way, and that's Jeremiah was left behind as a prophet to the poor. And uh, they, they had no use. They, they were not going to amass wealth through poverty. And so Jeremiah was left behind to the poor of the land. Ezekiel and Daniel were the prophets. Uh, and Ezekiel prophesied to the people that were in Babylon, whereas Daniel was more of a prophet to the kings of Babylon uh, that would come. And so just to give you a rudimentary idea of the Babylonian captivity that took place here. 
Now, Daniel was about 18 years of age when he was taken to Babylon. He was approximately 92 when he died there. Now, the children of Israel were to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And they were, and then they were released. Daniel was there for 74 years. He was there through, the, through and beyond the entire 70-year captivity. Obviously, by the time that Daniel, uh, even though he, was, he could have went back to Israel and was a member of the king's household, at 88 years of age, a journey of hundreds of miles through the Middle Eastern climate would have probably been too much for him. And uh, Babylon was never his home. As far as his heart was concerned, his home was Israel. But he spent his earthly life there until he went to heaven. Now, it's also important to realize that there is a difference in the Bible, for students of the Bible, between Egypt and Babylon. Egypt is a picture of the world influenced or under the control of mankind individualistically, okay? If, uh, there, there are always those people that they don't want, any, they won't, they don't want anybody to reign over. We're going to do our own thing, okay? Egypt is the world where every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Every man pursues his own possessions, his own pleasures, his own amusements, his own prosperity. Babylon is a picture of a systematic control governmentally over the whole world so under satanic influence. you got to remember that there is evil. We always blame Satan for everything. Now look, Satan, we don't give him a pass. He's to be blamed for quite a bit. But a lot of times what we blame him for is, is what's in man's own heart. And he's not to be blamed for that. The, the proof of that is when Jesus Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years, the devil will be locked in the bottomless pit during that time. Men, the Bible makes it very clear, will worship idols and, and uh, walk in their own, their own ways. And when Satan is loosed, he'll amass an army without number, quickly. There's a difference between the evil that's in a man's own heart and the evil that is satanically orchestrated and governed by the, whom the Bible calls the God of this world. Babylon is a picture of Satan as the God of this world. That will help you, as you read your Bible, understand the principles and how they apply to us, Okay. Now, we don't know much about Daniel's heritage other than the fact that he was obviously from the, of the king's seeds. Uh, well, that meant he was of the lineage of David. If you was to compare, and I, for sake of time, I'm not going to, but uh, the books of uh, 2 Kings chapter 20 and Isaiah 29, it would lead us to believe that he was likely a direct descendant of King Hezekiah. Not necessarily in line to be the king on the throne, but of the royal family. Now, da Daniel was honored and trusted through the changing of four kings and two world empires. Un unprecedented in any kind of world history, let alone the biblical record. Daniel was a master of self-denial. He possessed character and self-control. Two of the four kings made public confessions acknowledging Jehovah as the one true living God of heaven and earth. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 and Darius the Mede in Daniel chapter 6. Now, their public confession did not mean that that meant that they were saved, that they put their faith in God and God alone. They may have, they may not. I hope they did, but we just know that they confessed God as the one true, acknowledged him as the one true and living God of heaven and earth. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the second to reign. He reigned only for a short time. And and uh, Daniel was put on a shelf during that time. But the night that Darius the Mede came and took the Babylonian Empire, God wrote with his, on the wall uh, those famous words, Thou art found in the balance, and found, by weighed in the balance and found wanting. And this night shall there be kingdom be taken from you. The one man that ignored Daniel uh, lost the kingdom. Darius the Mede came in and immediately uh, saw Daniel's wisdom and placed him uh, over, over the entire kingdom, second only to himself, just as Nebuchadnezzar did. And then we also know that he died early in the reign of King Cyrus. Daniel was a prophet. He was a sage. The Old Testament prophets, I don't think we always have a clear understanding of what they were. They, they, did, not just, they did not just speak to the religious climate of the, of the nation. They always spoke not just to the 
religious climate, but to the political climate, okay? You don't find separation of church and state in your Bible as, as people like to think. You will find that civil government is one of God's divine institution, and they work in harmony together. The home, the church, the state, the workplace, all these things, everybody has roles, okay, and res different roles and responsibilities that co-labor together. The Old Testament prophets were men of insight as much as they were foresight. They spoke and gave wisdom and guidance, spiritual guidance, to the day. They were political statesmen. They were advisors. In fact, you would think of them more if you was to really have a, to understand their importance, uh, who, men who we have made very unimportant today. Uh, they were, think of them as the cabinet leaders in the United States of America. Or, or the Joint Chiefs of Staff, something like that. They would be more like those akin to the, the, the President's Cabinet. Now, it's still popular in our nation today for the President to have some appointed pastor that's kind of the official religious leader that's kind of looked to, and there's always somebody like that, but we don't have much to look at in either case today. Now, but, so Daniel was a political statesman, an advisor. That was very much a part of of his place as a prophet. They were the spiritual conscience of the kings and of the nations. By the way, if you read your, your Old Testament from 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles, you're going to see this very clearly, especially also in the books of the prophets. Now, the wisdom of Daniel is only exceeded by the wisdom of Solomon, but Daniel is a better example of wisdom because Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, but he lived as the greatest fool. Daniel was a man that behaved wisely. And there's a reason why he was sustained through four kings and two world empires. The name Dan means judge. The name Daniel means God is my judge. If you're going to make decisions with purpose, that's important. Daniel was being taken to a foreign land hundreds of miles from his home. He was going to have a new king even though he was of the, the lineage of the kings of Israel. And Daniel had to make a decision. And he had to make a decision on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. And one thing that Daniel, the crux of what Daniel decided is that he didn't go to Babylon to be a rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. He did everything he could, and it's very obvious by his testimony that he had a good testimony in a very wicked place. He did everything he could to honor the king. But he would never let his king come before his God. Because at the end of the day, Daniel wasn't concerned about whether he was judged by man. He knew that he was going to be judged by God. By the way, he was willing to go to the lion's den in his 80s. That's what I love about Daniel. From 18 years old. By the way, you don't have to be old to grow a brain. You can... You can you can, be, you can be wise as a young person. You can live a wise life all your life. And you can even be tested in the eight seasons of life and, and die with your boots on. And it begins with saying, you know, there's, we're losing this if we're not careful. We need to, as children of God, to realize that God is my judge. Whatever that costs me here. However that lines out here, that's what, what, what happens here is, is secondary to standing before God with a clean conscience. Daniel was everything that God's people ought to be from childhood to manhood to death. Not a blight on his record. I understand that he was, a, that, that he was not without sin, but he's one of very few men in the Bible of whom no sin is, is recorded. He's not... He is what every saint can be and ought to be. He was the man well beloved by God as testified by the angels. Now Israel's under judgment, by the way, for forsaking the poor and for forsaking her Sabbaths. She had, she had ceased to worship her God and had fallen into idolatry. By the way, for 490 years, one day in seven belonged to God. God always gets what's his. And so for 70 years, God redeemed his Sabbath by putting them into captivity. But Daniel was a righteous man. Do you know there's always a remnant of righteousness? Even in the midst of a cricket and perverse generation, there are always da some Daniel. There is always an Isaiah. There is an Ezekiel. Uh, there, there, there is uh, 
there, there is a Micah. There, there are always some, there are faithful and good people that when the world was going into rebellion and even the nation was going to rebellion, there were some that held the line of righteousness. Now, the sins of one, uh, that when one suffers, all suffer. It's a part of being a nation. And the nation as a whole had sinned against God and so that fell on the remnant of righteousness. That's the law of sin. But God does not forget the righteous. God has not forgotten us in a, in a nation that's filled with... I don't know about you, but I, I, the stuff that, that you see every week and that you hear about every week, I, I, it really, it staggers to mind. I could never have conceived the things that we are seeing today. And it, look, as Leonard Ravenhill used to say before he passed away, if God does not judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom had no Bible and had no prophet. So what's our hope? Our hope is in what we see in the life of Daniel. In wrath, God remembers mercy. He does not forget the righteous. He manifests his power, his love, and his grace. And judgment never comes. It's one of the things that I love about the, the prophets. If you start reading in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the minor prophets, and sometimes we kind of get weighed down in there, and you just it's, it's all the different nations and uh, and all the nations of the world of that day are listening. It's just judgment, 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 judgment. But if you pay attention, there's always a promise of hope and mercy beyond judgment. And Daniel reminds us that there is hope beyond judgment. Now, Daniel's decision, first of all, I'll just share a few things with you. Now, Daniel's decision, first of all, it was a personal decision. No one made him do it. We, we understand, you know the story here, that when Daniel was brought and, and all the young men of Israel, and probably other nations were being assimilated at the same time, and they, they, they took the wise young men, of the, the members of the king's whole household had the best education in science and art, literature and mathematics, all those things would have been found. The best of education was always in the house of the kings, and those of the royal household often became the cabinet, as it were, to the royal, to, to, in the family and to the king. So it makes sense that Daniel's a part of this. And that when he was brought to the king's table, he made a decision that he would not defile himself with his portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank from the king's table. That he, he, that, that he did not want to defile himself. Uh, and, and look, no, his parents are not here. It's obvious everybody else was doing it. Everybody else, you don't find any other than... Uh, the, the other three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let me just say this about their, their names. Daniel is called Daniel because that's his name given by God. That's why in the, it's called the book of Daniel. And all through Daniel, in spite of the fact that, Belteshe, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Belteshazzar, that's the only person you ever find using it. God never did. We call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names because in chapter 6, the, the interaction is between Nebuchadnezzar and them as Babylonian citizens. Not their, it's not between them and God, or they'd be known as Azar, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But because Nebuchadnezzar is speaking, he calls them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because that's where their names are most used, used most often. That's why we refer to them by those names. But, but Daniel's sitting at a table, and at that time, the, only, the other three made a decision because Daniel did. But Daniel was the one that made this decision, and he did it when nobody, when everybody else was just going to go along with what was going on. He did it without parental oversight. He did it without compulsion. There was no one to keep Daniel on the straight and narrow. He kept himself from transgression. He would not defile himself. He wasn't criticizing. You don't find a word of criticism about Daniel towards anyone else, but Daniel just made up his mind for himself that he was going to do what was right. Right is right. If everyone's against it, wrong is wrong. If everyone's for it, that didn't matter to Daniel. What others did or did not do had nothing to do with Daniel's decision. By the way, if you're going to make a decision with purpose and you want hope in a time of judgment, you're going to have to make certain decisions for yourself, not because your mommy or your daddy or because your grandma went to this church for 100 years or because the pastor said so. Because let me tell you something, no pastor lives forever either. Someday the pastor's going to change you. If you made a decision based on, uh, based on your parents or based on the influence of a pastor or anyone else, when that person is out of your life, the decision's no longer valid, and you won't keep it. 
So it was never something you made, it was never a decision you made in your heart. It was a decision you made based on somebody else for a period of time. That Daniel made a decision in his heart. By the way, Bible decisions are timeless decisions because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was not worried about what Melzar, the master of the eunuchs, thought. He was not concerned about what Nebuchadnezzar thought. He was concerned. By the way, this decision was made based upon his personal public testimony. If you read the book of Daniel, if there's anything you learn in Daniel's life, he had it. Daniel was no Pharisee. He was no whited sepulcher. But with, with meekness and humility, he was going to make sure that he kept a, a pure testimony. By the way, what a great decision to make. That we're going to live in this world with a pure testimony. That we're not going to be ashamed, that we're not going to be, a, uh, that we're not going to hide it, and we don't care what anybody else thinks, and we're not concerned about consequences. By the way, Daniel was very much hated as much as he was loved. He was very much conspired against and, and criticized as much as he was revered and honored. But Daniel's decision was not was based on a much higher observation than the relationships that he had in this world because those were always changing. For one thing, he's a member of the king's household in, in Israel and now he's living uh, uh, in the palace of a king in, in Babylon. God was his judge. He wanted to be pure in his testimony when he'd be judged by God. Let me just help you with some simple things that, we, that I just try to remind us of from time to time. Decisions are not based on preferences. They're based on Bible convictions. Preferences are what we hold. You can change those, okay? If you want to put up a Christmas tree one year and put a bale of hay and an ox manger the next year, that's a preference. That's fine. Help yourself. But a conviction is what holds us. A conviction means that we have been convicted in our heart by the Spirit of God through the Word of God, the Spirit of truth, His Word is truth, that this doesn't change no matter what changes. Convictions do not change no matter what changes. There were, let me tell you something. When they went to Babylon, there were preferences that absolutely changed. There certainly were. What were they? We don't know. They don't matter. What didn't change is what mattered. The conviction. Daniel was not going to change because a conviction did not change and com Preferences are not worth... By the way, you'll know the difference between a preference and a conviction, what you believe and what you don't believe when, you, when it might cost you your life. But conviction, convictions are worth dying for. Preferences are not. And there's a great truth here. We live in a Babylonian world ourselves and we have to choose if we're just going to live by the status quo and assimilate into the comforts and the conveniences of Babylon or if we're going to be Bible Christians and live by conviction. Number two, Daniel's decision was meant to keep him pure from defilement. He, uh, he, he, uh, now, I want you to think about this. Uh, just put yourself in him. I mean, that's a long journey to be taken across that Middle East. Day after day, took weeks, if not a few months, for Daniel and his, in the house of the king's servants to be taken to Babylon. And all the, every day, you're dealing with the emotional sorrow of seeing the destruction of your nation, of your city, of your king, and you're a member of the king's family. By the way, we're members of the king's family. Can you, uh, and at 18 years of age, I, I don't want to get into, I, I'm not into this post-traumatic stress disorder thing because we make, we make a plague out of empowering being victims. You don't, you, one thing you'll never find with a Daniel is a victim attitude. There's just, this is what my life is now. And whatever God's will is, I'm going to stay true to God. And then he gets to Babylon. And as far as they know, they're prisoners. And in being, instead of being taken to prison, by the way, their king, you have to understand, their king had been put in prison. His children, he had had his, his, his the King Zedekiah's children, they brought him before King Zedekiah in Babylon. They slit his children's throats and burned his eyes out with hot pokers. What do you think Daniel and his friends were thinking was going to happen to them? What do you think they thought was going to happen to them? 
as far as they know, they are preparing themselves for death or at the least life imprisonment. Now imagine this. Then you get there and instead of prison, you're put in the palace of the king. That's a, can you imagine what that would have... They didn't see that coming. And now you're brought to the king's table. Look, nobody ate better than the king. And I'm sure they were pleasantly surprised. Most of these young men sat down at this table, and you have to understand the Jewish dietary laws forbid them from certain unclean animals. They could not eat pork. They could not eat a fish like a catfish that did not have scales. They could not eat uh, shrimp or things like that. And all of a sudden, uh, they get down to breakfast, and here's bacon and sausage links and sausage patties for breakfast. Honey-baked ham for lunch and pork chops for supper. Cheeseburgers on Monday. They couldn't eat a cheeseburger. They could not see their kid in his mother's milk. Kosher law says you don't mix dairy with protein, with meat. So they could not have a piece of cheese on a cheeseburger. Just rejoice in your Christian liberty today, okay? <laughs> Thank God for Acts chapter 10. I, I say it's, it's, it would be blasphemy what we do on Resurrection Sunday when we celebrate at a sunrise breakfast ham for the lamb, Okay? I mean, can you imagine Monday shrimp cocktails and Friday catfish? The table of the king was not kosher and filled, and it was filled with unclean meat for the Jew. Now listen to me. I've been to Bible college. I know what happens when you put a group of religious young men that think they know everything together in a dormitory room. They lose their minds biblically. They discuss if Adam had a belly button. They want to know who the sons of God and the daughters of men are. I mean, they just, they strain at gnats and swallow camels that even the Pharisees wouldn't touch. Can you imagine these guys? Now listen to me. I want you to get something here. This was Babylon, not Israel. I'm sure that came up. We're not in Israel anymore. When in Rome, do as in Rome. We are no longer under the government of the law of Moses. We are under the government of Nebuchadnezzar. We're to honor the king and obey the king. So we must eat at this table. This is how a Bible college student thinks. And a lot of preacher's kids. A lot of you, too. I've talked to some of you. The dietary laws were not moral, only ritual. They were laws of a lesser degree, so they didn't matter. Then why did God give them? Daniel's decision in a very, I'm sure, what was a very heated debate amongst the sons of Israel he made, a, he made a decision. He's like, I don't... By the way, if you follow your Bible, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Do you understand that according to the Bible, if you follow Romans chapter 14, other places I could take you, this is just a separate, separate message, but I'll just take a swat at it since I'm here, and I think I will this Wednesday night. If we are not sure what to do, we, we hold the line that has been given until God reveals it clearly. You don't make the change. That's what Daniel did. He will, perhaps, think about it. He was under Babylonian authority. He was at the king's table. He is to honor the king. But in ritual law of Israel said, don't do this. You could call it either way. If you have to make a choice between Babylon and Jehovah, you follow Jehovah until Jehovah makes it clear. That will help you in your personal and your public testimony. Daniel's decision was made with purpose and with daring. See, Daniel was more worried about offending his God than being given to his own personal appetites at the king's table. You know what, the church, that's a decision every one of us has to make in this world just about every day of our lives. Daniel was more concerned about being pure and not offending the holiness of his God, defiling his God, than he was about his own personal taste and appetites. He was, God is my judge. He was more afraid of being judged by God than the Nebuchadnezzar. By the way, this did not make Daniel popular. Purpose will never make you popular. He chose that pulse. Look, look, he chose that, that pulse. Uh, that, let's look at verse number nine. 
Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children of your, which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel, but Melzar said, why should I stick my neck on the chopping block for you? You want to kill yourself? Fine, but I'm not going to help you do it. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Notice God calls them by their Hebrew names. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, Deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar uh, took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them the pulse. Gave them pulse. Now that pulse was simply so that we can understand they lived on vegetables and the grains, breads, if you would. They would eat. Daniel would eat, and his three friends would eat the would eat vegetables and breads and drink water. He would not eat meat and he would not drink wine. Now, let, let me, uh, uh, so they kind of went vegetarian or vegan, if we might say, okay? Now, he didn't have to go that far. In fact, the New Testament makes it very clear that those who give themselves to this diet weaken themselves, okay? But I want you to understand what Daniel decided at this moment. Listen, there would have been lamb, there would have been goat, there would have been chicken, there would have been beef sitting right next to the pork and the catfish and the shrimp. Probably more, listen to me, probably more that they could eat than they could not. At the king's wine, you have to understand, they had ways, do you, I, I have taught this before, but do you understand that they could, from, they, could, they could preserve wine for over a year without fermenting it alcoholically? And did. The common, the, it, it, we look at the word wine in the Bible. The preferred wine, they preferred non-alcoholic. That was the best, was the fresh. Alcohol, when it fermented, was what they had when they didn't have anything else unless they were given to a drunken appetite. At that table, there would have been fermented and unfermented wine. He, there, was, there was meat for them to eat and drink for them to drink that would have been kosher, that would have been clean, and Daniel could have done that and been clean in the sight of his God. So why did he decide for vegetables and bread and water? Because folks, what do we know about Daniel? He had the most pure of public testimonies before men and towards God of just about anybody in the Bible, maybe second only to Joseph, and probably more so than Joseph, in some ways. If Daniel was eating lamb and drinking the unfermented wine, somebody was going to say, I saw Daniel eating ham today. Somebody was going to say, I saw Daniel when he took his meat and he took, he took a piece of the catfish. I saw Daniel and he poured the wine from the, wrong, from the other pitcher and he drank the fermented wine. Daniel's decision was not pretentious. It wasn't to be holier than thou. It wasn't to be better than, than, than somebody else. His life and his testimony verify. By the way, name anybody else that came out of Israel in this book not named after these four men. And again, these three wouldn't have made this decision had Daniel not led it. It's very clear that this began with Daniel. No one was going to watch Daniel eat a piece of beef and claim that he ate a pork chop. Nobody was going to watch Daniel take a, a drink, a glass of, of, the, of the best and the, uh, of the unfermented wine and, and accuse him of drinking alcohol. He was leaving no room for doubt when others sought opportunity to compromise. Can I help you with making decisions in your life? Make a clear decision. Make a clean decision. Make a decision based first on your purity in the sight of God and that what presents the most pure testimony in the sight of man. Make it with the purpose. Daniel purposed in his heart. It was a decision in his heart. It wasn't haughty. It was a heart decision. If you haven't made it with purpose, it's meaningless. He wasn't trying to show off to the world. He was trying to take a stand for his God. And he stood out. And we live in a day of this camo Christianity where everybody just wants to blend in. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to do anything wrong. We, we think that because I don't cuss at work and I don't drink and I don't go to the wild parties and I don't laugh at the dirty jokes, but we also, we don't want to stick out either, do we? 
If you live like Daniel, we need somebody, do we need somebody to stick out for Jesus Christ in this world? Does the Bible say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven? Look, we don't put our we don't light a candle and put it under a bushel, Jesus said. Daniel was letting his light shine. By the way, he's associated with that in Daniel chapter 12. I quoted that verse this morning in Sunday school. Or read it after I tried to quote it and couldn't get it. Make a clear decision. Daniel's decision was made with purpose and daring. We used to sing a song when I was, maybe many of you did too. Uh, dare to be a Daniel, dare to take a stand, standing, and... Uh, um, I can't remember how it all goes, but dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Make it known. Have a public testimony. His decision was proven by demonstration. Give us 10 days. 10 is a number of proving in the Bible. Daniel allowed God to prove God through Daniel to the master of the eunuchs. People need to see the proof of God in us. That's what I was just saying. Are you willing to make a decision for God so that make yourself available to God to choose in some way, whatever you choose of your own free will, that in this way I'm going to give myself to God so that God can show himself to those about me. I think when you do that, can, can I just say this? Daniel didn't do this so everybody else would do it. Now, I'm glad that, that, she, that Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael did this. Okay? And he did have a little influence. But Melzar didn't give up his meat, did he? Did any of the other Hebrew boys give up theirs? No. Did Nebuchadnezzar give up meat? No. He did when God turned him into a beast for seven years and he ate grass like an ox. You don't see the rest of Israel. See, we think that if we make a decision that everybody's going to jump on the bandwagon, and then when we don't, we don't keep that decision. Friend, it don't matter if anybody gets on the bandwagon or not. We do this for the Lord. And we do it for a public testimony, and God will be glorified in it. Whether it changes anybody else or not, it made a difference in us, it made a difference to God, and the testimony is recorded 2,500 years later. We know the story. Daniel and his friend turned out to be wiser, better students than all the... Well, isn't it amazing how people think they have to compromise to the God of this world to get along in this world? That Daniel, if he was going to advance himself in the king's kingdom, that he would have to compromise his, the, the doctrinal body of faith in his God that he held to in the Old Testament. You're never going to get ahead in this world as a child of God by compromising your biblical convictions. Da Daniel, uh, Daniel turned out him and his friends the cream of the crop. By the way, you can read anywhere else in the Bible and you're going to find that the visions and the understanding of dreams that God gave to Daniel is unparalleled by any prophet of the entire Old Testament period. And God showed things to him that he showed to no one else except maybe save the apostle John and still showed Daniel things that John didn't see because they were come to pass by the time John came along. Now, I'm sure Daniel was criticized. Don't mess this up for us. We got a good thing going. Don't you rock the boat. They don't have to have us here. We're not going to the prison. We're not going putting our head on the chopping block. And Daniel, we're not putting our head on the chopping block for you. I'm sure Daniel... Yeah, see, it's one of the reasons we don't make decisions anymore. It's one of the reasons we don't see the revival anymore because in a revival, that's a place where we start making personal decisions about our relationship with God and our testimony towards others. By the way, in a revival, it's not that people get saved. It's that people get right with God and renew their relationship. And as we get right, it lets our light shine. And as a result of that is that the world sees it and they come to the light. But we don't want to make a decision. We don't, back, we don't even want our kids making decisions at camp. I'm tired of taking, I've, look, for 27 years I've been taking kids to camp and watching them come home to parents that will say, and say, and they make public their decision to their parents and their parents say, no, you're not going to do that because I said so. No, I, could, I, could, I don't have time. I could wear you out with stories. Daniel, don't rock the boat. But in heaven, I wonder if God said to the angels, you watch that young man. 
He's going places. I can trust Him. I can use Him. I can't use... These are my own people. I'm not going to use them like I, like I will Daniel. I'll show these people something. I'll elevate Daniel. Humble yourself therefore under the almighty hand of God and he shall exalt you in due time. Daniel did not make this decision with the expectation that he was going to be second to Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't make this decision knowing that he would be second to three of the four kings that would rule and the one that did rule without Daniel only reigned for about five months. See, Daniel did this decision so he could please his God and make a difference in his world. He, he didn't know all the things that God was going to do with him and through him and for him. By faith, he first made the decision and then God honored him. Let me just ask something. Do you want God to use you to make a difference in this world for Jesus Christ? That's the decision. And Daniel, when he made that decision, God positioned him by divine appointment. His decision did make a difference. God did put him in the cabinet of the king. He became the king's most trusted. And look, in those days, the kings trusted nobody. There was always somebody there that any time the king took his cup to drink or his food to eat, there was one guy whose job was to taste it first and had to take a good portion of it to make sure it wasn't poison. Somebody's always trying to kill the king. Read your Bible. There were several of Israel's kings were killed and assassinated. There were very few people that the king trusted. Why? Because everybody wants the king to be the, be the king's friend for their own personal advantage. Daniel was trusted and loved and cherished by unbelievers. And it's likely that he, a Jew, ruled over the Babylonian Empire for seven years while Nebuchadnezzar crawled around feeding like a ox. Let me ask you something. It was just ritual law. It was just the day-to-day -day things in life. It was those gray areas of the Christian life where we're really not sure there's no, no right, no wrong. What's wrong with it? Not what's right with it, but what's wrong with it? Well, God wants me to be happy. And, you know, all the things that people fuss about. They could just, honestly, it's a matter of the heart pursuing either the pursuit of God and His glory or pursuing just our own personal passions and desires. Evidently, God thought this was an important decision. Anyway, if, it not, if it were not for this decision, if Daniel hadn't made this decision, what would have happened in Daniel chapter 2 when the king's word came to cut off the heads of all the seers and the prophets and the wise men? What would have happened in Daniel chapter 3 when Nebuchadnezzar raised that image of gold and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did make a stand. People always want to say, where was Daniel? Daniel was probably, you know, let's give credit where credit's due. We don't know where he was, but he, knowing what we know of Daniel, a man from chapter 1 to chapter 6, do you really think he bowed and compromised? He was most likely in another part of the Babylonian Empire away on business. It's reasonable to presume. But would those three young men have made that decision? What about in, in, in Daniel uh, chapter uh, 4? Uh, when, uh, the, when Nebuchadnezzar had been turned into an ox and made a proclamation uh, uh, that, that Daniel's God was the one true and living God of heaven and earth if Daniel had not made this decision. What about Daniel uh, chapter uh, 5 when he was brought in as the only man that could give an answer to the writing on the wall before Belshazzar? What about Daniel chapter 6? If there's one thing we love about Daniel more than anything else, it's the story of Daniel in the lion's den. A man, we always draw the picture of him as a teenager. He was, into his, he was well into his 80s by then. But that's, that's, that's more, you don't get chapter 6 without chapter 1. Probably the most pop, one of the most popular stories, it certainly makes the top 10 of famous Bible stories of the Old Testament all time. If you can't take a stand at the supper table, you'll never, you'll never. That decision to come out of the lion's den was made a long time ago. Decisions determine your direction. Direction determines your destination. And your destination will determine destruction or your eternal delight. Uh, this just, look, this is just a simple message. It's just a simple, simple truth. Let me ask you something this morning. I'm not talking... I'm not talking to the kids in children's church. I'm not talking to the kids that went to camp. I'm talking to God's people this morning. When's the last time you made a decision in your heart for God? That God, I wanted, I'm going to make this decision 
because I believe that this is something that you would do in my life to be a public testimony for Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning, you don't even know what that would be. Maybe you do. Maybe God has, there is something in your life God has spoken to you about. So maybe, you need, maybe you need to come and say, Lord, would you show me something that I could purpose in my heart to do for you? To stand out in the midst of a cricket and perverse world? To let my light shine? That they might see this good work, not to glorify us, but to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message this morning. We pray that your word has been an encouragement and a strength, Lord, to, to your people, Lord, in our daily lives. Father, there's great recognition and glory in the fiery furnace and the lion's den, but Father, it starts with a bended knee, personally, in simple purity, making a decision where you prove ourselves in your lives, in our lives. We pray that today in a house of prayer, Decisions will be made to do so in Jesus' name. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. The Lord's spoken to you somewhere along the way. Maybe you don't know what you need to decide, but maybe you just know you need to decide something. And you want to come and make yourself available to God and say, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Whatever you reveal to me, why don't you give God a chance like Daniel's? Say, here's 10 days, God. Let me make this change in this life for 10 days and see if I'm better off for Jesus Christ because of it. I don't know what God wants you to do because it's something he's not going to tell anybody but you. But Daniel knew what he needed to do. And if God wants us to make this decision, he's going to reveal. Maybe you're here today and you've never made the decision to give your heart to Jesus Christ as your Savior. It begins with that decision first and foremost. You're not saved. You need No, you're not saved. You need to be saved. Why don't you come and make the decision to give your heart to Jesus Christ today?